And so we'll orbit Jupiter, but make these flybys of Europa and the close approaches. How close are you going to get? 25 kilometers what? in some of the closest ones. And, uh, That's as close as any object has ever swung by anything. It's, it's going to be in the, extraordinary. And, and the images, half a meter per pixel. What? Yeah. And the Galileo images. So think about how extraordinary the, the images from Galileo, Galileo the mission. spacecraft. Yeah. Okay. Because he was an actual person. Not the person. astronomer. He didn't have that <laughs> And he did have a telescope. Right. And he did look at Jupiter. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so make sure we're on the right. Yeah, Galileo did not have half a meter per pixel <laughs> resolution. So, so <laughs> Galileo the astronomer. Yes. Point of light. Yes. Galileo the spacecraft. We get uh, beautiful pictures at, you know, kilometer scale. Suppose you could just tell Galileo oh what goodness. you're about to do. Oh, Oh. That, what a what a privilege that would be! Oh, absolutely. I mean, and and you know that's four hundred years ago, four hundred plus right? years. That's ago. not even that's nothing. That's nothing in the that. history of our species. Yeah. yeah. And, Just uh, say you know one day we're going to go there. Yeah. One of your Medician. Yep. So you're going to a close view of the surface right. ice. Yeah. But you're not looking at the water below, and that's what you really care about. Right. And so what Clipper has on board are cameras to give us pictures of the surface, spectrometers to tell us about the surface composition. And by looking at the surface ice, we know from Galileo spacecraft, from uh, telescopes, that- this, And Hubble helps out. And Hubble, yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, that the ice of Europa serves as a window into the ocean below. So using the spectrometers and looking at the ice, we will get a bit of a fingerprint of the ocean chemistry. But that's only because there are cracks that would, might that's fill right. in with the water Geology, and then refreeze. That's right. And uh, subduction, subsumption, uh, overturn. What is subsumption? Uh, it's, uh, it, that, you know, that shouldn't even be a word. <laughs> uh, just my opinion here. <laughs> yeah. Subsumption? Yeah, it's a term uh, I, uh, coined by some colleagues of mine. Just oh, you, so you all, you all just made up the word. <laughs> now, okay. as, as we okay. do. Because right? I know there's subduction right. as when a, a continental plate goes under. That's right. And then there's... Yeah, and so subsumption... Give me, give me some other words here. ...is kind of thinking about uh, how that might occur on an icy shell. So for the most part, you can think about subsumption as subduction, but on an icy world okay. with perhaps some other things mixed in. Did it really need another word? Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, debatable. <laughs> <laughs> but so with Clipper, we've got these um, uh, cameras and spectrometers and then mass spectrometers that will allow us to taste any plume material coming oh. out of Europa, what well, we can we can taste any organic compounds, Ooh. carbon compounds. So taste, I, you mean almost literally taste, because oh, if yeah. you have the molecules and you have something to detect the molecule, yep. you, you've basically tasted the molecule. That's right, exactly. And and so With I'm your a, machine. I'm a co-investigator on the SUDA instrument, which is a dust analyzer mass Suda. spectrometer. Uh, surface analyzer for dust uh, at Europa. Okay. It's a, <laughs> acronyms these days are. Uh, okay. Are all over the place, <laughs> I'll give you that. Yeah. I'll give you a hall pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't necessarily go by the first letter of the word anymore. Okay. But. So that's more of a passive experiment because you have. You got. You're not. You're it. not aiming for those. It has to sort of come to you. Yep. If it happens to be spewed forth from the surface. Exactly. Think about a kid with a bucket running through a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's much more muted than that at Europa, but we will be getting those compounds into okay. our bucket and passing them no, through no, the mass spectrometer. And these aren't big plumes like you find on Enceladus, but there is certainly upward mo movement. Yeah. So I've been on uh, a team that's used the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope to look for plumes on Europa. Isn't it great we have telescopes that can see the edge of the oh, universe and then right in front of our nose uh, as well? That's, <laughs> this is, this is, this is, uh, we got good people. <laughs> <laughs> we can get amazing things we got, done we, we when got uh, some we people. set our minds to it. Our people are um, good folks. Not well, just so, the astronomers, but of course the engineers that actually make it that's happen. Right. Shout out to that, the engineer here. Okay? They, they get the hard stuff done. Um, so Enceladus is a tiny moon. It's only 500 kilometers in diameter and very low gravity. And so plumes on Enceladus go out for hundreds of kilometers. Europa is about the size of our moon. And Europa's gravity is about one seventh. So of Europa the Earth. is way bigger. Way bigger. Three thousand kilometers. I, in I didn't diameter. even think, think about that. Yeah, and so so five hundred kilometers in American speak. That's like three hundred three hundred miles, miles across. Like yeah. All right. It's still a nice object, but yeah, it's, it's not it's, like it's not like Europa. Right. And uh, so, what are the chances of you seeing sort of macroscopic life that might have 
bubbled up and landed on the surface, like fishes flopping. Are you asking if our bucket's going to catch a squid? <laughs> <laughs> and you reminded me, we you advised on the movie, the sci-fi movie, low budget, but still a carefully conceived and executed movie, The Europa Report. That's correct, yep. And I have a tiny cameo in you that. You do, I did yeah. a tiny little yeah. cameo. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was on CNN. Uh, they used actual footage of me on actual news right. commenting. I said... I want to go ice fishing on Europa, <laughs> cut a hole, <laughs> lower a submersible yep. and see what's there. Yep. Uh, and uh, that was expressing my enthusiasm for this. You and I, that, uh, oh, if we could fish on Europa. Oh, man. Uh, so you were an advisor to that film. That's right. Okay. And they that, did a fantastic job. That's uh, why it was so good. <laughs> Not because I was in it, but because <laughs> they thought about the science. Well, one of the really cool things, uh, you know, I've done some consulting on various movies and I was like, hey, team. If we're going to do Europa, we got to do Europa right. Uh -huh. And so they um, didn't know that much about the radiation environment of Europa. From Jupiter. From Jupiter, yes. exactly. And and so um, that's factored into the movie and becomes sort of central to the story. And on Europa, that irradiation of the surface um, would <laughs> kill an astronaut. But coming back to habitability, one of the things that we're looking for with Europa Clipper is how some of the radiation-driven chemistry on the surface of Europa could positively affect the chemistry of the ocean and the habitability of the ocean. Let me give you an example. Sulfur comes from volcanoes on Io. The eruptions on Io exude sulfur, and some of that sulfur actually lands on Europa. This is sulfur that has been spewed forth from volcanoes faster than the escape velocity of Io. That's right. Thereby contributing to the general orbital environment of Jupiter. That's right. It gets spun up in Jupiter's magnetic field. Next thing you know, that, that sulfur ion is slamming. Well, it's an ion, so it responds to the very That's strong exactly magnetic right. field. That's right. But then, so some of that sulfur impacts Europa and then gets radiolytically processed into sulfate and other forms of sulfur, which then, if mixed into the ocean... Sulfate. Sulfate. Microbes sulfate. on Earth That's love sulfate. And then get, that, get this. So what happens when you split apart H2O, water? You get OH and H. Some of that H escapes to space. Some of the OH recombines with another OH, forming H2O2. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. We have observed- Which is the same thing as what- anyone would call peroxide. Exactly. In, in, at the in pharmacy. A, in the pharmacy, a, yes. Yeah, and, and so... That's that old joke. You know the old joke. <laughs> no, what's that? Uh, someone goes to the bar and said, I'd like some H2O. And then they hand him the, a glass of water. And then someone sees that and says, I want some H2O too. <laughs> and so they go, get a glass of <laughs> and peroxide. They get a, and then they drink it. <laughs> 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 That'd be a very chemically literate yeah, bartender. Right, right. And not, not a very tasty drink. You know? <laughs> but so, so get this, that radiation processing of the ice, of the H2, uh, of the water ice on Europa, leads to the formation of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which then that also gets radiolytically processed or decays to O2, oxygen. And w telescopically, we see... Hydrogen peroxide and oxygen in the surface ice. You have to be very clever to go from one step to the other to see this through. A game of dominoes, and you don't know where the dominoes are, but you think you do, and maybe it is. Yeah. And if it is, this leads to that, leads to that, yeah. and then you have what you need. Right. Except we actually observe it. So to be clear, we see condensed phase oxygen on the okay. surface of your And robot. you think that's how you get it. Right. We get it radiolytically. I do that in my cool. lab. And, there it is. and uh, I love when you say that. I do it in my lab. <laughs> Need somebody? I, my lab. <laughs> and that's the, the fun of like lab and spacecraft. I know. And, it's uh, great. So, it's great. And they uh, go hand in hand. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we can mm -hmm. make predictions and, uh, and uh, it's a lot of fun. But so, of course, we know that oxygen is very useful for life on Earth, not just for microbes, but for- Well, for our kind of life. For macrofauna. There's anaerobic life does not like oxygen, that's just right. to be clear. And they, they love sulfur and, yeah. and methane, all sorts of other things. But so here you are, the radiation uh, environment on the surface of Europa could produce compounds, which then if delivered to the ocean through subduction, subsumption, whatever you want to use, could help provide rich chemistry to the ocean to sustain a biosphere within Europa's ocean. And this will give you some of the chemical gradient you the chemical described gradients, that you exactly. need. So you got hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents on the bottom of the ocean spewing out things like methane and hydrogen and sulfide. And then from the ice shell, 
you might have things like oxygen and sulfate. So you can connect the battery, the biochemical battery. And that's how you make Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> At least this is the recipe for, for Godzilla. Yeah.